glad to see all of you are able to hang around here as the conference heads into the, the final home stretch. And uh, uh, you look forward to this panel and, and probably also the beer later on. Beer. Um, but, uh, you know, this is, uh, of, of all the sort of programs and initiatives that fall under the um, the umbrella of ISPCS, certainly one of the biggest and one of the most well-known is the Commercial Crew Program, uh, NASA's long-running initiative uh, to develop or uh, support the development of commercial vehicles that can transport astronauts to the space station and serve other applications as well. Um, three companies have been at the forefront of that program recently. Uh, Given the, the audience here, you probably know a lot about what's gone on in the last month or so uh, in terms of contract awards and uh, a GAO protest that's gone on. Um, just a disclaimer up front, because of the, the nature of, of the current state of the program, um, there will be a number of questions about that particular procurement that are going to be um, basically off limits. I'm sure that they would like to talk about them. Their lawyers probably don't want them to talk about them, so we want to keep the lawyers happy uh, on that. Uh, but sort of, sort of like uh, how boundaries stimulate creativity, restrictions like that may offer some new opportunities here. Um, we focus so much on the commercial crew program on the aspect of the, the NASA facing aspect of supporting the space station. But certainly it was the intention of the program from the very beginning to also serve commercial markets to have vehicles that could serve many different customers, not just a single space agency, but everything from space tourists to commercial researchers to space agencies in other countries that want to fly astronauts into space. And certainly the vehicles that are being developed in this effort uh, can serve those markets. So this is an opportunity, um, since, we, um, since we're restricted in what we can talk about in some other areas, to delve a little bit more deeply into the commercial side of commercial crew. So what I'm asked is our, our three panelists here, and I'll introduce them very briefly in a moment, to spend a few minutes to give a little introduction, a little bit of background about your efforts and where you see the commercial markets. Uh, emerging and then we should have some time for, for questions and answers so please do start filling out those cards with those questions um, again keeping in mind that there may be some questions that the panel simply can't answer at the current time um, but we've got here uh, from uh, start right here with uh, Mark Strangelo. You saw Mark up here on the stage just a little while ago uh, the corporate vice president uh, Sierra Nevada Corporation Space Systems uh, we have John Mulholland. He is the Vice President and Program Manager for Commercial Programs uh, in Boeing's uh, Space Exploration Unit. And then we have Barry Matsumori. Barry is Senior Vice President uh, for Sales and Business Development at SpaceX. And if you were here yesterday, um, you heard Barry as well. Um, the program has much more detailed bios. It's a much better use of the limited time that we have to have them talk. So Mark, you want to take it away? Sure. First, uh, I'd like to congratulate Jeff because he is uh, now representing Space News as well as many other things. So congratulations on your, on your movement and, uh, and starting that new part of your career. Thanks. And, uh, and being this moderator for us, we appreciate that. I think, um, to Jeff's point, the, the idea of commercialization, I, I think probably has driven all our companies. And NASA for us and the space station is a, is a solution, is a point solution, is a type of thing that we can do in low Earth orbit. But it is on, it's not only the only thing that we can do. And I think the idea behind this whole program from the very beginning, if you go back to the original documents, was to find a way to stimulate and, and uh, bring interest to developing transportation systems for low Earth orbit, not for the space station particularly, but for all of low Earth orbit. And in our company's case, we went very much into that direction, saying that there are many different areas that we can look to servicing. The, the idea of being able to go out and fix satellites, uh, move them so that they're not future debris, to be able to be an independent laboratory, to be able to go out and potentially fix the space station and upgrade it in the future, to be able to provide transportation to other destinations that may be there. I think that one of the things people assume is that that's, as the ISS is going to be there for a long time. We don't know that. There could be other, that station, uh, for whatever reason, in the next five or 10 years, maybe decided that uh, for budget reasons or other reasons that we're not going to have it anymore. So do we need, as an organization, I think as an industry, need to be thinking about how do you continue what we need to do in low Earth orbit? And I think our system was uh, particularly uh, well designed for that purpose, to be as utilitarian as possible. And I believe all the companies have that as part of their tenant, to be able to do 
that, that type of work in commercial space. Great. Thanks, Mark. John? John? Yeah, absolutely. And I think uh, when you look at the, uh, the emerging industry, you know, it is very exciting. It's, it's really fun to watch Xcore and, uh, and Virgin Galactic and, and others uh, start uh, looking forward to their initial flights in the suborbital market. You know, with, with orbital, I think it's uh, significantly harder. It's obviously a lot more expensive for market entry. Uh, and, and I think really the market for orbital space tourism has really waited uh, for the CCT cap award. You know, we talked to a lot of people, obviously, um, and they really wanted to make sure that we were going to be real and which ones of us were, were going to be able to, to really continue and, and to start flying in the 2017, 2018 time frame. And, and, and now we're, we're close. Um, and, and I think uh, after we work out um, everything over the next 90 days or so, uh, we'll be able to, uh, to move forward and, and really capitalize on that. Uh, it was really essential, I think, that NASA established the foundation and the infrastructure. Right? That really was, I think, a big barrier to market entry. Um, and when we look at, at our prospects, you know, our, our main focus um, has got to be completing the NASA mission and starting the initial services flights to the ISS. Um, and, and that's really going to allow us to broaden it. Uh, what we're looking for um, is to further our partnership with, with Bigelow, Bigelow Aerospace. You know, I think the real value uh, of CST100 or really any of our, of our platforms is, is purely just a transportation platform. You really need a destination. Uh, and, and as other folks have said, we need destinations beyond the ISS. And so what we're focusing on, uh, at least initially, is, is partnering with countries that aren't spacefaring nations today uh, that for their own national purposes want to, um, uh, want to advance scientific research uh, for their national or academic purposes. Um, and we're trying to partner with them, uh, with us as the transportation platform, uh, Bigelow as, as, the, um, as the destination provider, and, and solve some national need. And, and so there is some excitement out there, uh, but I think it really is still early. You know, the other thing we're looking at, uh, and we have a partnership with Space Adventures, uh, because our capsule does have additional capability and to try and partner back with NASA so that we can fly additional uh, scientists or passengers up uh, through space adventures to try and do research and, and stimulate uh, that market you know, one passenger at a time. So it is really exciting, but I think the real focus now is, is making sure that we stay on plan to start the services missions to ISS. Thanks. Barry? I'll just provide uh, two perspectives that are kind of interesting. Uh, one is, um, as, as was said, uh, John said, the foundation has been set for more growth in this space. And one of the foundations, I think NASA's done a great job of the CRS program, uh, both Orbital and ourselves. Uh, fortunately, we've been able to deliver, and Orbital's been doing a great job of delivering. And it provided this excellent means that they can go and look at the next program and know how to manage a more, much more complex program and build it based on more commercial terms, more commercial methods, so that that foundation can go and allow much further growth of the commercial space. So that's interesting. The other part that's interesting for me is um, I, I'm coming from the tech world and seeing more and more of habits of the tech world coming to aerospace. And, and that's great. I mean, uh, there's all kinds of challenges that we still have coming that all you have to do is go look at what happened in the mobile space, in, in uh, the internet space, and you'll see fights that you can tell are coming. IPR fights are gonna start coming. And why? Because the intellectual property is actually worth having that somebody wants to fight over. And, and I'm not suggesting it's a good thing, I'm just suggesting it's a character and nature of the beast. So there's a lot of interesting things that are coming and all of it is about growth. The other thing that's interesting is new entrants that have founders that have various backgrounds that are going to come in and I mean if you look at the internet space it's filled with people that had nothing to do with the internet before it started and it's going to continue that way. You're going to have new entrants, new people, they're just very smart, uh, in ingenious, uh, they may have a little money too but they're going to do, do something and that's create new businesses that we've never thought about. Thanks. 
<clears throat> I think you know we, we've heard here from from some of the discussion some ideas of what some of these potential commercial applications could be um, space tourism um, commercial research sovereign clients other nations flying are there other applications you're thinking about that your vehicles could serve in any way that we haven't uh, mentioned here so far I think from our, our side, I've mentioned a lot, I think there's one other area that is, is pretty interesting for us, and that is uh, we are always concerned about being able to have something go wrong with one of our assets in, in LEO. The ability to carry up a special telescope or be able to do uh, some type of work if we need it as, as a country is something that we've been looking at, and we think that type of rapid response or, or restoration kind of approach, if it's necessary, having uh, a, uh, an ability to have a vehicle that's capable of doing that is something that we think is, is useful. I, I, there's kind of boundless opportunities out there, but I, I think for us, um, beyond you know, what, what I talked about before, really the barrier is, is lunch vehicle price. Um, and, and we need mm -hmm. to get to a price point in the, in, in the lunch vehicle industry that is significantly below, I think, where we are today. You know, um, Barry and his team are, are making wonderful strides there. Um, ULA has got great plans to, uh, to, to lower that price point. I think once we get down, and Jeff talked about it a lot this morning, uh, once we get down to a, a price per seat rate that's uh, an order of magnitude maybe lower than we are today, I think it opens it up uh, enormously. Hmm. But for right now, I think it's, it's still uh, a small number, I, I think, of spaceflight participants and then national national prerogatives. Mm -hmm. I, I completely agree with John and and that is if you can't get cost per kilogram to a point that um, a larger population can get up into space not only with with people but the infrastructure uh, the logistics to be able to support these people the logistics to be able to support uh, operations and and uh, some kind of production in space um, none of that can start. So you got various pe uh, pieces of this puzzle that need to come together still before it's a large scale business in space. Um, besides the, the, the pricing issue, what other barriers do you see to greater commercial use of such vehicles when they're available? I'll let Barry start. <laughs> now we're finally all laughing. Um, <laughs> The, uh, the barriers, uh, there, there, there is this notion of where are people going to go? What's the destination? What's the objective? Um, which comes first? Do you have lower uh, cost access to space that feeds a business? Or is there something that's attracting the business and people go regardless? I don't know if I know the answer to that question. And I'm pretty sure we don't know how that, how that engine's going to start just mm -hmm. yet. I think a lot of it is, is, is the growth rate and then the stability afterwards. Uh, obviously, if, if, if launch rates uh, go to 50 or 100 flights a year, mm -hmm. uh, no matter what the launch vehicle, you know, the production capacity is going to have to grow enormously. And, and the factories that support that, um, if, if the market tails off, uh, then your price just enormously goes up. And so you really got to have a lot of confidence in, in, in the stability of the market. Uh, to be able to support it. I think I would probably look at the barriers to globalizing this, this type of effort. Uh, the reason the ISS works is because of the fabulous international partnership that NASA has set up where not only are people contributing, but they're getting something out of it, either research or being able to do manufacturing of modules or, or sending up ATVs or mm -hmm. HTVs. And being able to do that for the ISS has been great, but then how do you take that type of model and bring it out to the, the industry as a whole? We, as I mentioned earlier today, are, are pushing that envelope to try to do that, but to ensure that the government, our governments and other governments look at this as something that's a positive and not a negative and not something to be regu regulated to death where it can actually stimulate a global industry. Uh, Boeing has been successful in the airplane business because it is able to sell its airplanes around the world and have that kind of market I think we need to try to move to that kind of level as well in what we're trying to do in low Earth orbit and make it a, a global project in many ways. Mm -hmm. You know, out in the, the hallway there may have, as you're walking in here and out, there's a number of posters up there. And the poster, one of the posters has a, has a quote attributed to George Gilder. Um, Supply creates its own demand. And the question is, 
does that apply to commercial crew? If you have a supply of these vehicles becoming available in a few years, does that create demand? And how do you factor that into your business planning? Yeah, I, I think I would look at it a little bit differently than that quote. Instead of saying supply creates demand, I might say reality creates demand. And meaning that this, as we have all gotten to a place where we're having real vehicles with real hardware and starting to get into flight tests as, as we are, we're seeing the, the input of people saying, this is no longer theoretical. And when it stops being theoretical, people are starting to look at what could we do with these vehicles? What could we do with one of the capsules or Dream Chaser? And that starts stimulating the demand because before that, no one was going to put energy or money into something they didn't believe was going to be there. And I think from our perspective, we're seeing that shift uh, pretty dramatically in the last couple of years as we've all become more real. Yeah, and, and I agree with Mark. I, and I also think that, um, you know, it creates demand, but we, we need to get ourselves to the point where um, the price is open to a lot wider segment of the population. Right? It's still a pretty small segment. Shall I say something? <laughs> Um, I'll say something in a completely different, uh, different realm. So uh, we're busy talking about uh, passengers in space to LEO, uh, either space tourism or some sort of logistics to LEO. And everybody knows SpaceX has goals that are a little bit further reaching than that, and that's about, about uh, Mars and humans to Mars. And so we are definitely going to support all of these efforts, but we're also in the background working on things that are going to farther destinations at the same time. And so for us, uh, we're looking at both markets at the same time, but we're definitely not distracted that one of, one of our primary goals is about humans to Mars. So if you Did you want to talk about Mars human? tourism? <laughs> <laughs> so if you have a choice between supporting humans to Mars and doing more it's um, not commercial. It's not binary that way. It, okay. it, 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 it all feeds with each other. All right. Well. You know, maybe you can look out here, um, you know, obviously these vehicles are still under development. It's going to be a few years before that they're ready to enter commercial service. Um, if you can look out in your crystal balls as, as chipped and cracked and cloudy as they may be, as, as all of ours are, um, look out five to ten years. What does the business look like for your vehicles in terms of supporting NASA, supporting commercial, supporting other government agencies, any, any predictions you can give about the mix of business that you see? Why don't you go first this time? <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I think um, I am really confident that, that we'll extend station to 2028. Uh, I think we will have uh, more than two additional space stations at that time that, uh, that are either, either privately owned or, or owned by another country. Uh, and I think that's incredibly important. Bill talked about it. Uh, a little bit in his talk that a as NASA leaves low Earth orbit to, um, uh, to take Orion and SLS beyond, uh, there, there needs to remain a platform there to do research uh, for us here in low Earth orbit. And so I think you'll have uh, probably two or three uh, platforms there. I think that you're going to see within a decade uh, the price point drop on launch vehicles um, significantly. And, and I think you're going to see uh, some space tourism market, uh, but I think more of it's going to be focused on building destinations and us providing service to. I agree with John. Great. I mean, <laughs> going with, with murky, first, murky really? crystal balls, uh, it's it's a it's a challenge to do that. I mean, I mean, there's goals and visions, but predicting what's actually going to happen that's very hard. So I'll, I'll agree with John. That's a good one. I think the one thing I would add, I, I also agree with John, but the one thing I would also add is that while we're all wanting the launch vehicle costs to go down, and I think John phrased it correctly, uh, that's a long time down the road in my view. It's going to take some time to get to those levels that really make that order of magnitude difference. So what do you do in the meanwhile? One of the things that we think we can do in the meanwhile is do more than one type of mission while you're up in LEO. Mm. To not only deliver crew or cargo, but maybe go out and fix something, or maybe do out some scientific work. Being able to do multiple missions on the same type of flight where you can take that launch cost, which is pretty stag static for at least for the next few years, and be able to drive that into multiple missions, driving the cost to the mission recipient down 
because you're, you're sharing that up. Much like when we launch our satellites, we launched six satellites a few months ago, and that six satellites drove the loss cost down so the per satellite launch cost was not as extreme as it could have been. John mentioned um, extending the ISS to 2028, and while there's uh, you know, at least a, a NASA proposal to extend it to at least 2024, the international partners haven't signed on yet, and there are, as, as the senator alluded to earlier, some geopolitical issues, particularly with Russia, um, that, uh, that might pose some issues to an extension. How critical is any extension of the ISS beyond 2020 um, to a commercial crew business case? I, John, I don't know if you guys want to go, but I think it's, I think it's imperative uh, in that if it's not extended beyond 2020, uh, then I think there's been a lot of, a lot of wasted time for all, these, for all this competition for the vehicle development for that solution uh, in that that needs to happen. I think the other part of it, which you mentioned, is maintaining the international partnerships is going to be a big challenge. And one of the reasons we went out and started talking to other space agencies is because of that particular point. NASA is no longer in the same position it was where it could do that barter as it did a number of years ago. People can't get on the space, the space shuttle and take those rides. And we've already seen ATV has stopped and HTV it's on his last, uh, last production run of vehicles. Japan and Europe are, are looking at the space station continuation as being different. And unless we can motivate them to maintain ourselves up there, uh, filling that gap is going to be quite hard for, for our budget. Yeah, I also agree. It's, it's essential. Uh, even in the best case, we're still going to be a fledgling industry uh, when 2020 comes around. Um, we might have three, five flights under our belt. Uh, we need that stability of station extension to, uh, to really stabilize it. The only, the only other comment I'd make is um, just like uh, space budgets are, are being challenged here. They're being challenged everywhere. They're challenged in Europe. They're challenged in Japan. And, and part of it is because all those governments need an inspiration of why they're going to spend more money. And so um, if, if we don't have this vision for them to go and be able to sell spending more money for their space programs, uh, it, there's only one direction those governments are going to go. And they're, they're going to shrink budgets. And it will suffer a space station. So, yeah, a space station is definitely necessary for, for commercial crew case, but more importantly, it's necessary because we need a longer term, we need just a little bit more runway to get all our visions in place and get all, uh, the world population excited about space. Let me check and see if we've got any questions. I want to make sure that we've got good. I think this is just so we remember who we are. All right, questions. Um, this one, this one's for you, Mark. Uh, the Dream Chaser design closely follows the conceptual work that we did on, did at Langley on the HL20, obviously from someone who worked on that. Uh, will the subscale version continue that history, the subscale version you mentioned in your talk earlier? Uh, yes, and, and I do want to do a shout out. I, I think there are a couple of people here from, uh, from Langley. And, we, we fully grant and, and give the credit to the people who worked at NASA. The, the original version of this, of Dream Chaser, was called the HL-20. It was meant to be the crew rescue vehicle for the space station. And uh, it worked, was worked on by 10 year, for over 10 years. And a, an enormous amount of work went on. And we, when we came in and licensed it out of NASA, it had been sitting basically idle for six or seven years. We took the, uh, the d database of data and the wind tunnel tests. There were over 1,000 wind tunnel tests done and use that as the basis for building Dream Chase. And we changed a lot about the vehicle. The thing we didn't change was the outer mold line, uh, which allowed us to be able to continue all that scientific work. But I'll tell you, we did an awful lot of research, and, and uh, the, the shout out is that the guys who did that work in the 70s and 80s and early 90s, doing it mostly with slide rules, they were within one half of 1% of all the supercomputing power that we put to bear. And it was an amazing thing to see how good they were with given the tools that they, they were using, we couldn't have improved on it really any better than we did. And what we're doing is that we then took that design and said how far down could we go and how far up could we go in size and keep the integrity of the design because once you go over a certain point, you have to redo it. And so that's where the, the, the two versions came from. So a good part of, part of that history, not only ours, but the HL20 history continues on and, and really lives in both of the versions that we have now. All right. 
Another question here for, for each panelist. Uh, we talked a little bit earlier about the fact that there be other space stations that these vehicles can service. Who will have a permanently inhabited space station first, China or Bigelow Aerospace? I'll let you answer that one. I, I don't think I want to do <laughs> no, that. No, I met, I met the man with the partnership here. <laughs> oh, this one, yes. Yeah. Have at it. Huh? Uh, I, think, I think Bigelow will. I think China's got ambitions further on and, uh, or further out, and, uh, and I think Bigelow is really focused. Uh, I think he's going to start building um, flight versions of the BA-330s next year, and so he is really excited, and, and he's going to push it forward. I think a lot of people know, but the, if they don't, there, there is going to be a version of that technology called BEAM that's going to be attached to the space station. Uh, we're part of that program in that we're doing the berthing uh, mechanisms for, for BEAM, but that's going to really take that technology for the first time and, and test it from the inside out with people with the ability to, there's, there are two versions of it right now, but I think the attachment to the space station is really going to take that technology to the next level and at least in my view, expedite what, what might happen as a standalone station. Uh, I'll say something a little bit differently, and that's I understand the question, I understand the nature of the question, but I'd suggest it's, it's, there's a real, there's a different question that, that's important, and that's what are the Chinese plan to do in 25 years, and they're planning for 25 to 50 years. And that, that's the part that we should be focusing on. All right. Another question here, we've, I, we've touched on this, but I'll, I'll, I'll bring it up again just to make sure we have, um, if there are any other ideas that uh, come out of our, our minds of our guest panelists. What commercial markets for orbital flight services other than ISS services does your vehicle service? So what, are, what other markets, we, we've discussed a few of them already, but if there are any other ideas, concepts um, that you're considering or have considered, or maybe you've considered and ruled out for one reason or another that might be of interest um, for these vehicles. I think one we can announce is maybe a spin-off of ISPCS in space. We're going to host one on our ship. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be a little cramped. Uh, well, so was the first concept. That's what we had it here. I don't have anything else uh, to add than I've said. No. All right. Sorry. All right. Well, another one. Uh, one, one year from now, what do you hope to accomplish and report back to ISPCS attendees? I'll start. I mean, <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, go ahead. Uh, for for me, um, it's not going to be about crew. I mean, we we'll we'll talk about progress on crew, whatever. But it's going to be about reusability and the accomplishments we made there. And so hopefully we'll be up here saying, yeah, we recover one. We understand how to how to refurbish it. It's going to be uh, something that actually starts uh, significantly lowering the cost per kilogram to orbit. Yeah, I, I think I was, I was very proud of my team uh, for the accomplishments they made on CCI cap. Uh, they performed to plan, and we got all of our, all of our uh, milestones accomplished. And, and I hope to be able to say in a year when I'm back here that we're continuing on CCT cap and we're performing to plan. I think from our side, we, we are um, really getting into the, the meat of our flight test program. And that's always exciting to see things fly. We have, we've had our first one, but we're expecting over the next year to, to really continue that. The Enterprise got five flights in before it finished its mission, and I think we're targeting doing a number of flights, both uncrewed and crewed, to be able to, to really characterize the flight elements of what we're doing and, and really show that hardware built. All right. We've got about a minute left here, so I wanted to give each of the panelists uh, any closing thoughts, final words of wisdom. Um, anything, you, anything you want to share with the uh, ISPCS attendees? Now you're stretching wisdom. Yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> Come on it's now. Late in the it's day. the late in the day. How much wisdom could we have left? Uh, I'll, 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 go ahead, Barry. I'll, yeah, go I'll ahead. add, Jeff, that, um, to, the, to the last comment. The thing that would be interesting, actually, in, independent of us three, is doing metrics of what new entrants took place in the last 12 months, what new products took place in the last, and start measuring how is, how is the industry growing. Uh, I mean, hopefully, what, if we're doing all the right things, that metric is a useful measure of progress in the overall industry. Yeah, so anyway, uh, for me, I don't, I'm, I'm great to be, it's great to be here. It's great to be able to talk about progress that SpaceX ma has made. But uh, more importantly, it's been interesting to talk to everybody here about the progress their own companies have made. Um, 
You know, the three of us, we have some competitive differences between us, but on the other hand, uh, we're all trying to do the same thing, and that's increased presence in space for humans. Yeah, and I'd thank Pat Hines for a great 10 years. Right. Um, and, and I'm, I'm going to be excited next year because I think you're going to see a lot of uh, successful tests by our partners in, in the suborbital. So it's going to be fun uh, to listen to George and Jeff next year because uh, they're kind of leading the charge yeah. in getting uh, paying passengers into space. I think I would just close by saying while there's, there's a, a well-publicized debate going on here, what isn't in debate is the fact that we all need, we need to be in space, that this program of moving our, our, our either or any of our programs forward is, is one thing, but the idea that this program, the commercial crew program, the work that NASA's doing, the work that we're doing as a country, uh, make that continue. That's not in debate by any of us, and I think that it's an amazing thing to see just how many companies are moving into the hardware phase. Uh, a few years ago, we were all thinking about theoretics and PowerPoints, and not only the three of us, but the other companies who are also yeah. doing it on a suborbital basis, and some now on an orbital basis. And I think that's wonderful. And the new partnerships that have been springing up, like was mentioned with Blue Origin and ULA and others, uh, I think that's really exciting. And regardless of what the debates may be about short-term things, the long-term vision of having uh, a sustainable real presence in low Earth orbit and beyond is not out of debate. All right. With that, um I want to thank the three of you very much for participating. Um, obviously, we were somewhat restricted in what we could talk about, but I think we ended up covering a lot of ground and, and getting some interesting topics about the future of commercial crew transportation. So thank you very much for your attention and hanging in there. Thanks.